This is an ether drag experiment appeared to confirm Fresnel's hypothesis that the ether, or the base on which light propagates, is carried along within a moving medium according to V times 1 minus 1 over n squared metres per second. There is no ether, of course, but light must still propagate relative to something. Any point around which the speed of light is uniform in all directions is the base on which light propagates, then that is constantly proven to be any point fixed with the ECI frame. I've carried out experiments using different setups, but not once have I found evidence supporting Fresnel's hypothesis. This is the basis of my experiments. With FISU's device attached to the Earth's surface and the medium in motion relative to the frame of the device, both the light beams and the medium are moving in opposite directions through tubes of equal lengths. Regardless of where the device is pointing, nothing changes. Removing one of the water paths sets up an asymmetry between the east and west pointing directions. This is how my experiment was configured. With my device attached to the Earth's surface where the rotation rate is 400 metres per second and a water rough flow rate of 10 metres per second toward the west, the water is still travelling east at the rate of 390 metres per second. When it's turned to point east, the water is moving at 410 metres per second to the east. That's a 20 metre per second water speed difference. The speed of light within the medium is C over N, so the light is lingering longer in the tubes and it will have been carried along for a greater distance by the time it escapes. The fringe shift I should have expected for a 4 metre total water path length and V equals 20 metre per second east-west water speed difference is V times 1 minus 1 over N squared divided by C over N times 4 equals 1.55 to the minus 7 metres, or 0.245 of a 634 nanometer wavelength. The outcome from that experiment was an old result. There was no evidence of an east-west light speed anisotropy but I had very little confidence in that outcome. Did I really understand these interference patterns? The setup used for the Mickelson Morley experiment in 1880 can be used to demonstrate that the interference pattern I was using was valid for the task. The light paths can be analysed individually and simply by unfolding the two arms at the beam return mirrors and taking a laser beam source and half silvered mirror with them. There will of course be no interference patterns generated by the beams from two different sources. Before I go any further, the integrity of the half-silvered mirror needs to be tested. Take note of the double image when the laser beam is reflected off the glass face.
This half-silvered mirror is the point of focus for the two beams of the unfolded MMX device. One leg is pointing east, while the other points to the north. The laser beam is initially reflected off the silvered face of this half-silvered mirror, losing 50% of its power, and then off the inner glass face at the far side. The glass face reflection is very weak and can be ignored. The remaining beam loses 50% of what's left of its power when it passes straight through the target mirror to a screen which is mounted directly behind it. Now for the east pointing beam. The laser beam initially passes through the half-silvered mirror and reduces in power by 50%. It then travels to the target mirror. The beam is initially reflected off the glass face, then off the silvered face of the target mirror. The glass face reflection in this case is very significant. The beam divergence is now wide enough for the two reflected beams to overlap. A reliable friend shift will only occur if the trajectory of beam north is shifted to the outside edge of the strongest element of beam east. To convert to the unfolded view of Fizu's Ether Drag experiment, all I need to do is shift the screen from the south side of the half silvered mirror to the west side and turn the half silvered mirror by 180 degrees. The beam functions are reversed. Beam north now generates the interference pattern. Beam east is now comparing with the strongest element of beam north. Exactly as it was in my east-west light speed anisotropy experiment. The three frames of this animation show the consequences of blocking the returning beam 3 or the returning 1-2 source beam.
the beams 2, 3 and beams 1, 2 interference patterns are identified. The beams 2, 3 fringes are to the left of the screen. Those are the fringes that will be affected by the anisotropy. In the quest to resolve the conflicts, I removed every potential cause. I replaced the half-silvered mirror with a beam splitter where there would be no feedback problems and I separated the two light beams that would normally share the same water tube. The laser beam is initially split into two parallel beams 12mm apart which travel along two water filled tubes where the water is flowing in opposite directions. The beams are recombined to follow parallel paths which diverge into each other enough to generate an interference pattern by the time they reach the screen, which has been tilted to be almost parallel with the beam trajectory. The screen needs to be set at a distance where the two diverging beams begin to overlap. The interference pattern is only magnified in the plane of the two interfering elements. Using two completely different light paths makes this device very sensitive to physical distortion. I wasn't expecting too much here. An 8.5 horsepower petrol powered centrifugal water pump proved to be absolutely useless for the water flow control. I replaced the centrifugal pump with the twin screw pump from my original setup and attached a 6 kilogram flywheel to the crankshaft of the engine. The water flow rate was still all over the place. The next step was to make a small torque converter to connect between the drive motor and pump to smooth out the bumps. The torque was transferred via a water medium. A trickle of water was maintained through the unit to stop the water boiling. Here's an example where the engine is idling and the torque converter speed is varied between idle and zero. The fringe wobble was still much greater than the fringe shift I was trying to identify. This is where I threw in the towel. The next step was to remove the rogue interference pattern in my original experiment.
Details of that experiment can be found here. The beam divergence from source to screen using my helium neon laser is less than 6mm. A 6mm thick half silvered mirror was enough to separate the beams so they wouldn't interfere. The two truly interfering elements can now be properly compared. The tilted screen is now used to magnify the interference pattern. The screen can be rotated by 180 degrees around the beam axis so that an alignment with the compare angle between the beams can always be achieved. It's around 10 degrees off horizontal in this case. This setup was used to generate the next clip. In the video clip, one flash indicates that the unit is now stable and the water flow is east. Two flashes and the water flow is west. Three flashes indicates that the unit is moving to the next target. The two beams that will interfere are set below the two bright spots on the screen, which result from the primary beam reflecting off the closest water tube window, reflecting off the glass face and the inner silvered face of the half-silvered mirror. The missing bright spot is beyond the screen limit. And the picture is inverted as well because the camera is upside down. There's still no sign of an east-west light speed anisotropy. It's now time to test the validity of Fizzo's experiment. All I need to do is reverse the water flow direction. That was a simple task. The water speed is set to 8 metres per second to minimise physical distortion. That's 16 metres per second for both flow directions.
So there it is. Reversing the water flow direction is a fairly substantial physical change. It would be very difficult to rule out physical distortion to the device as the cause. The fringe shift can be accounted for if I apply a 20 gram sideways load on the copper tube leading into the laser end of the device. Such a distortion would be evident in the global picture there. But the same fringe shift occurs for every possible compare angle scenario. There's no doubt that this phenomena is caused by length relationship changes between the two beams. <clears throat> I'm left with only one answer here. The laser beams lose a substantial amount of energy on the journey through the water tube, which can only be caused by an interaction between the beams and the water. In my east-west light speed anisotropy experiment, since there's no detectable anisotropy, that interaction remains constant for all pointing directions. Reversing the water flow direction is an entirely different ball game. The fact that both beams travel through the same water tube is very significant as well. Each beam affects the environment of the other, which will further retard the progress of each beam. The beams are carried along with the flowing water wherever it goes. Physics ether drag experiment shows the consequence of light beams travelling in opposite directions through a liquid medium which is in motion relative to the light source. It doesn't lend much support to Fresnel's hypotheses or anything else. My null result proves that an east-west light speed anisotropy is beyond our detection capability. No sensible universe would have a problem with any of this. Right, thanks very much for your time.